Well, if you'll find 1 Samuel and chapter 13 tonight, and I want to kind of preach a little bit of a mixed message. Certainly a, 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 tonight it's, it's really a topic or a theme type of a message. And so maybe something just a little bit different, but we have been looking in, um, in the Scripture at the transition period from the judges to the kings in Israel. And really as we've been doing that, one of the things we've been looking at is just kind of the mind of God or the heart of God, the way that God works with mankind, the way that God responds to men. One of the things that we have seen again and again is that God does not change, uh, but what we do affects how God responds to us. For instance, uh, the children of Israel wanted a king. God didn't want them to have a king. It already written in the law, when you get a king, this is how you're going to do it. God knows what man's going to do. Uh, and so God gave him King Saul. But then after God gave him King Saul, he let him know, but I'm still going to be your God. You're still going to be judged. You're still going to answer to me. You, you're not going to get a king to stand uh, between you and take responsibility between you. You're, now you're just going to have to answer to a king and to me. You want a different authority? Well, go ahead and add an authority to your life, but I'm still, I'm still God. And that was one of God's responses uh, toward the people. Another thing that we saw that had to do with God's attitude was when we saw Saul being rejected as king. And one of the things God explicitly stated to Saul was, I would have established your throne. Your seed would have been established forever. There are people that say, well, God's going to do what God's going to do regardless. The reality of it is, is that God told Saul, my plan, my intention for you would have been to have given you a messianic line or seed, the one that David got instead of him. One of the uh, refreshing, I guess, uh, caveats as you're going through is Saul's son Jonathan. And Jonathan again is that is that reminder about the heart of God. That, you know, sometimes we think that if we get a position, then that's what God views as greatness. For instance, king. And God says, wow, king. You know, servant. Ugh, servant. Uh, you know, God doesn't view things that way. At all. You know, a lot of times we forget that because we're respecters of persons, that God isn't a respecter of persons. And the Scripture, over and again, God's Word explicitly st states that God is not a respecter of persons and that we're not to be either. And so last week we looked at the relationship between Jonathan and David, and we asked who was David's chief rival or vice versa? And at the outset, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be a wrong answer to say, well, Saul and David were rivals. But you know, Saul and David weren't really peers. Uh, Jesse and David and Saul would be more peers than David. David would have been much younger than Saul. And it, when he became king was after Saul's reign was over. So David's real competition was not Saul. David's real competition was Jonathan. Saul's son, who Saul wanted to, in spite of God's promise to Saul that, hey, you're done, your son is not going to be the king, uh, Saul still wanted to supplant God's plan and make Jonathan that king. So Jonathan and David should have been rivals, but what did we see last week? Jonathan and David were friends. And Jonathan's promise to David was, I know God's not going to let my dad hurt you. Matter of fact, I know you're going to be king of Israel. And my dad knows it too. I just love that, that Jonathan just added that in there. And then he said, and I am going to be your best servant. I'll be your best friend when you're king of Israel. And boy, there's a lesson in that, isn't it? See, if Jonathan thought that it is terrible that he didn't get to be king, he'd misunderstand his purpose in life. Friend, you know, there are a lot of believers that struggle with title or position because they're not willing to understand that greatness is achieving God's purpose for your life. If you want to quote this evening, you could you could take that one. Greatness is achieving God's purpose for your life. It was what God wants for you. There's nothing better than that for you. Uh, you say, well, somebody else might, God might have something better than that. No, no, my friend, it's like this. This is a hundred. And if a hundred is... God wants you to be a servant, and you're the best servant you could be. You get a hundred. This is a hundred. And if a hundred is God wants you to be the best king, 
and you're the best king, then you get a hundred. But God's the one giving the grading scale, and a hundred's a hundred. You can't be a king when you're supposed to be a servant and get a hundred. And you can't be a servant when you're supposed to be a king and get a hundred. You and I need to learn that what God wants for our lives is the best, the only way that we can be satisfied. And so Jonathan is the classic example for that. And I just can't help it. Jonathan is probably, I have to say, one of my favorite Bible examples of just character in a good man. I just, I, I can't find fault with anything in his life. Look at Jonathan. I just can't find anywhere that he wasn't just the example of courage. And that's what we're going to see this evening. I want to look at courage and leadership. And so we're in uh, chapter 13. We'll read a verse or two there, and then uh, Willie will read forward uh, in chapter 14 a couple of verses. And then I want to apply it. And when we apply it, we're going to take a leap, and so you're going to have to be ready to jump, okay? Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 5. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Beth of In. And in verse 6, When the men of Israel saw they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And then going over to uh, chapter 14, would you look with me at verse 11? This is speaking of Jonathan and his sword bearer. We'll read our way into this, but I just want to get to this point so we can have a place where we can stop and ask God to help us with. Verse 11, And both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they have hid, had hid themselves. That's not a very nice thing to say. Let's pray for God's help in the message tonight. God, we do need your, your help in the message this evening. And I just pray that we would see what Jonathan and even his armor bearer saw and the results of individuals exercising faith and becoming leaders as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this story is one of my favorites. This would just be one of the stories when I just want to read something. I like to. I like a thrill or in something inspirational sometimes, don't you? Mm -hmm. I'm not one of these people that just likes to, you know, be all gloom and doom and only think of failures. I like to look where, you know, the underdog wins or the good guy wins. And I, I uh, lament a little bit that culturally we have actually gotten to the place where the bad guy is glorified. Uh, the villain is not villain is not a bad word anymore. It's a cute word. It's a comical word, actually, isn't it? And you say, Pastor, not for me. Well, have you watched any of the later movies? I haven't so much, but I have watched uh, Despicable Me. That's really funny, isn't it? Uh, you know, you, you, I, honestly, the the villains are hilarious in Despicable Me, aren't they? But they're kind of harmless and cute. The bad guys are. They do evil, and uh, they're trying to do like, it's harmless and cute. I've never been able to watch Batman. First of all, because I don't like watching dudes in tights. Second of all, because of the ratings of the movies, I just it's just too much perverseness in it. But Batman has got to where the Joker's the good guy. Gotten to the place where the bad guy's the good guy in it. Roy Rogers would never approve, and certainly the Lone Rangers, the Lone Ranger would not be the Lone Rangers, as <laughs> you already just said. It's Sunday p.m. Welcome. Uh, and then uh, so I could just give you instance after instance. Uh, the first cute uh, reversed, you know, the villain being the good guy was Monsters, Inc., right? Uh, you ever watched that one? These are Pixar films, but, you know, it's, it's really a cute movie, and it's about monsters scaring children. But the monsters actually aren't bad. They're just a little bit misguided. And it turns out that it would be better to make children laugh than to frighten them. And so they become lovable instead and that sort of thing. But we uh, really, Monsters, Inc. takes the whole idea of evil monsters, and which really usually are probably representative of devils uh, and demons, and we make them cute and lovely and that sort of thing. One of the things we don't 
anymore admire very much of is courage. You don't uh, see a lot of inspiring quotes, and you don't. We don't admire courage very much anymore. I tell you, if you want to get under my skin, just say the whole the line that everybody is using in every bad incident nowadays, and that is, "See something, say something." Say something. I hate that. I just despise that. Don't say that to me unless you're just trying to set me off. You know, see, it's like you're really courageous. Somebody needs to do something because something bad just went down. Now, I say, see something, do something. That's courage, right? There's a problem, do something. Uh, you know, we just took two weekends ago, we did first aid and CPR class. You know what I thought of it was? Was that we actually live in a generation where people would be afraid to try to help. You know, it's like, oh, call 911. You know, that's the first thing you're supposed to say. We've all been joking about, call the 911. You, uh, find the AED. And you, you know, you all these things that you do before you do first aid and CPR. Are you okay? And the, checking the breathing and all the, the steps to CPR. But I'm just thinking, you know, in the spineless society we live in, people are probably afraid to even do CPR. Honest truth is, uh, there are people that are afraid of the liability of it. There are people that are just afraid because they're uncomfortable with it. You know, we just don't have, we just lack courage in our society today, and that's just a fact. Uh, but evil, man, I'll tell you something. If I see a guy snatch a purse, you know what's going to happen? No, no yeah, I, I, that's, that's like last resort. I'm going to take him down. And the proof's in the pudding. I've done it. Uh, if I see somebody committing a crime, I'm going to say something to them. <laughs> I'm going to say, you move one more time, I'm going to knock your teeth out. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to say something. You know, it's like, you, if you don't quit moving, you know, I'm going to hurt you bad. You think you're hurting now. I mean, courage, folks. I'm serious about this. You know, we live in a spineless society where evil just can run rampantly because people are absolutely cowards. Here we see an example, and we find that this isn't really new. Uh, the Philistines have 30,000 chariots. Could you imagine if you went to a parade that had 30,000 chariots and you had to watch every one of them go by? <laughs> That's a lot of chariots. And it's easy to say 30,000 chariots. But just think about that. I mean, can you imagine trying to feed the horses? I mean, just, you know, grease the wheels. What, you know, I mean, this is... That's, that's a lot of chariots. Uh, they had... Um, 6,000 horsemen. Can you imagine going to a parade and having to watch 6,000? The first horse, oh, that's a pretty one. Oh, that's a big one. Oh, that's an ugly one. Oh, that... After 6,000, you'd be like, mm -hmm, you know, more... that's a lot of horsemen and a lot of horses. And then the Bible says, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. If we're talking 30,000 6,000, and we're like, yeah, we couldn't count the... You, know, you can count to 30,000, that's a lot. Sa uh, like sand on the seashore. Just go grab a handful of sand, plunk it down, and spend an afternoon counting the grains. And don't get too fine a grain of sand. Okay, don't go to Pensacola. Go to, go to a rougher beach. All right? Try it sometime. That's a, I mean, just sand like the seashore, okay, that's a lot of Philistines, and that's a serious problem. But, the, you know, the real problem, though is the lack of courage. Lack of courage. You know, God has never looked and said, oh, 30,000, that's a problem. God's never looked and said, oh, 6,000 horsemen, that's a lot of horsemen. My friend, when God meets evil and the world of evil comes out to face Him, God says, you're dumb, and they're dead. And when you're on God's side, that's the reality of the outcome. In other words, for a believer who is in Jesus Christ to do right, you never have to question whether things will end up okay. That does not mean that every single time you'll never have pain. Every time you have to fight a battle, you won't get pain. It doesn't mean you can't die, physically speaking. But listen, if you're a child of God's and you do right, you cannot possibly have a bad outcome. You just can't. You say, well, I don't want to have pain. Well, we're not talking about you having pain. Well, I don't want to have somebody not like me. Well, we're not talking about you being popular. What we're talking about is right. You know, Christians try to make decisions about right and wrong, and there shouldn't be a decision any more than just determining which one is which. 
Once you know what right is, you ought to do it. Just go with it. Just go with it. Courage. And, and here we have the children of Israel, and they're, they're hiding in their rocks. And the sad thing is what we read in verse 14. Jonathan and his armor bearer came out, and in verse 11 of chapter 14, I said verse 14, but verse 11 of chapter 14, when he and his armor bearer discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines, the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. Now, do you think that they were saying, Uh-oh, the Hebrews got out. Well, they're making fun, aren't they? Oh, look who came out of the rocks. What rock do you crawl out from under? They're making fun, and uh, they're about to figure out that you don't mess with people that actually have courage. And that's Jonathan. I just, man, Jonathan, when it comes to courage, I don't think there's a greater uh, example of a courageous man. So let's look at what Jonathan did. Uh, everybody's hiding. And in chapter uh, 14 and uh, verse 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass upon a day uh, that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. Okay, so there's so many Philistines. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and uh, men like the sand on the seashore. And, you know, there's a particular garrison or a holdout, a fortress area, where about 100 of them uh, would be in an outpost. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, let's go to the outpost. Now, if I'm going to be thinking about it, Jonathan's style is probably not quite the way I do it. I'd be like, I'm going to sneak in there at night, and I'm going to slit their throats while they're sleeping. No, no. no. <laughs> so I'm going to be sneaky about it, you know. I'm not going to go take on 100 guys one-on-one -on -one, uh, or two on 100, whatever, one on 50, I guess is how that would, how that would uh, equate. But Jonathan did. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, hey, let's go to the garrison of the Philistines. Was he crazy? No, he's courageous. Here's why. Here's the deal. Jonathan knew that God did not want his people that were called by his name hiding in holes. And Jonathan said, if there's going to be anybody that's going to go down fighting, it's going to be me. Listen, people may go hide in holes, but I'm not going to. I'm not ashamed. You know, today, listen to me. Today, there are issues, aren't there, that Christians are silent on because of the flack that you'd catch for it? And we need some people with courage to say that's evil. That's evil, and God, God's not okay with it. God can help you. God can save you, but it's not okay. And by the way, I'm not okay with it, and I don't care what you call me. I don't care what you say about me. It's not okay. And we can just deal with the issues. We can deal with adultery. People shacking up, living together in sin in the church and in the world. And it's a problem. And it's the detriment of our society. It is destroying families, and it's any family that's destroyed has children who are literally damaged goods. And by that, I do not mean God can't heal them, but they're damaged goods. It messes the people up. And it's not okay, and God's not okay with it. There are homosexuals that are proud to be in bondage to sin. And our society lauds them, applauds them. Last week, the last week that Dwayne Wade, the best player the Miami Heat have ever had, the last week story about Dwayne Wade's last week playing basketball wasn't even his basketball, it was that they support his homosexual son. That's wicked. It's not okay. And Dwayne Wade, great basketball player, he's trashing his child. Him and the trashy woman that he's married to. Or destroying that child. And it's not okay. We need people that have courage to say, you know something? That's evil. That boy Zion is going to be wrecked because of what that father's doing. And he was wrecked because of what his preacher mother did raising him. And it's not okay. It's evil. And we need people to just say it. And just go ahead and say it in public. Listen, they're pushing the gay pride parade. They're pushing the kids out there in public. And somebody needs to say to the kids, hey kids, this will mess you up. This will wreck your life. This will take you down a road that is very, very difficult to get off of. 
when God's against it. And you know something? I'm not going to apologize for something God's against. I'm not sorry about that. We need some people to have some courage, but you know what Christians do? They hide in holes. They hide in rocks. And I, for one, am not one to say a homosexual can't be saved. God can save anyone. And I've seen homosexuals come to Jesus, but they won't get saved by our saying it's not a sin. They won't get saved by our mocking their sin. They won't get saved by our overlooking their sin. We need some people with courage. We have people hiding in holes, people hiding in rocks in Christianity, and believers are a mockery. They're mocked by the wicked. And here we have the wicked Philistines defying, not defying the servants of God, defying God. And Jonathan said, yeah, I'm not in a hole. I'm not in a hole. Now, Jonathan's standing, and he's looking around, he can't see anybody standing with him because where are they all at? They're in holes, they're in rocks, they're in caves, they're hiding. You know something, Christian? If you're going to wait for other people to do it, you're going to hit the grave before you ever find someone else. Stand up first. Look what happened. First thing that happened was that Jonathan's armor bearer went with him. One became two. Look at verse 1. Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come, let's go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. <laughs> but he told not his father. Uh, I don't wonder why... Jonathan didn't tell Saul. Saul would have said, you know what, you're my son. I don't want you to endanger yourself. Don't go there. And there's Saul tearing under a pomegranate tree you know, with 600 men. <laughs> now it's interesting. Jonathan's got one. Dad's got 600. Uh, in verse 3, the people, the end of the verse, the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And here's the story. Between the passages, this is verse 4, by which Jonathan sought to go over under the Philistines' garrison, there's a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes and the name of the other Sina. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said unto the young man that bears armor bearer, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. You see what he calls them? When the Bible says uncircumcised and it's not Judaizer saying it, what does uncircumcision represent? It represents a heart. Yeah, it represents a wicked heart of sin. It represents people uh, that are not under the law. Remember when Zipporah, Moses' wife, circumcised his son? What did she say? Surely thou art a bloody husband unto me. And what she was symbolizing is we have had to come under this law, this bloody law. And you know something? It was God's law. And Moses submitted himself to it. And so we as believers don't want to be represented by the, uh, being uncircumcised. That is not under God's authority. The Philistines are uh, being described here by Jonathan as people that defy God. They have no respect for God's law or for who God is. You say, Pastor, but only Israel had to be circumcised. No, anybody who came to God had to. Because to come to God, you came through Israel. It came through God's law. And everyone was invited to do so. And so it represented people that were wicked. That's what the representation of being uncircumcised. When Jonathan says that, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's alluding to. And he said, It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. The second thing we see about Jonathan is he's willing, first thing he's willing to stand alone. The second thing was he understood that God doesn't really care about numbers. God was not saying, oh no, 30,000, 6,000, say to the seashore. God was saying, Jonathan understood that God wasn't impressed by that. And he said, you know something, if I'm on God's side and God's not impressed by that, then I'm not either. Now, was Jonathan, physically speaking, a match for a thousand? Not without God's help. Matter of fact, we don't know if he's a match for more than one. I mean, look at the giant of Gath. It depends on which Philistine's being represented. We don't know that Jonathan was a match for more than one Philistine. But what Jonathan knew was that God was more than a match. And the truth of the matter is that if God didn't want the victory, Jonathan didn't have a lot of reason to live in defeat. You know, sometimes we as believers would do well to just get backed into a corner to where it's fight or die, but no flight. I don't like fight or flight either. That's another phrase I don't like. 
It's fight or die. That's, that's the way I think a courageous person's wired. You say, Pastor, you wouldn't run away in a dangerous situation? I, you know, I, if I, you know, if it was the way to save people's lives, you know, I don't want to have to knock out ten people or whatever, you know. So, <laughs> yes, I believe there's a time when it's wise to retreat. And by the way, I'm not a fighter, in the sense I'm not a striker. I don't want to hurt people, uh, but I'm gonna tell you something. I'm not afraid of people either. I don't think any person that's that can be, and no man who's self-respecting can look in a mirror and be afraid of people. I know guys. I just I grew up with guys. Uh, they they you know they might have been smaller, they might have been weaker, but they weren't quitter. You know what I mean? And so you just didn't don't wrestle that guy because he'll never quit. You'll take him down a penny, but if you let him up, he'll kick you in the back of the head. <laughs> you know, if you walk away, you turn your back on him, he'll just keep coming. And you realize you just better not mess with that guy. And uh, why? Because he's not afraid of you. He might should be afraid of you, but he's not. And so a little bit of courage. You say, Pastor, it's a little bit stupid. No. You'd be amazed at how a society that has those kind of people in it uh, is a lot more settled down. You don't have road rage incidents when you might mess with somebody that might do something. You know, the reason people mess with people is because they don't think anybody can do anything. Because why? We have so little courage. And so you ought to, you ought to be wise about just entering into conflict for the sake of conflict. You oughtn't want conflict at all. You shouldn't be afraid of it either. See what I'm saying? It, it, it's a matter of, does God want this? Does God want His people hiding in holes? Jonathan knew He didn't, and Jonathan just figured, I'd rather die than hide in a hole. We ought to be that way about sin. I'd rather die than just do nothing about that. We need some people with some courage. Because evil's evil. And God can, God, God's not the, the weak... Uh, end of the match. God's not the weakling. Uh, but it oftentimes, the wicked, the Bible says, the wicked flee when no man pursue it, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You know, sometimes the righteous aren't righteous. That's the deal. Sometimes the reason you're not bothered by evil, sometimes you're not bothered by uh, evil doers, is because you've got more in common with them than you do with the, the servants of God. Jonathan didn't have anything in common with cowards. didn't have anything in common with evildoers. And so he wasn't hiding in the rocks. And so in verse 7, his armor bearer followed him. That was our second point. His armor bearer said unto him, Do all that's in thine heart, turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. He said, his armor bearer said, Hey, if they're going to kill you, might as well kill me. I'm, I'm in, man. Let's go. Then said Jonathan, Behold. It means, look, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. Well, that's a pretty bold thing to do. We're not going to sneak up on them. We're going to face them. If they say unto us, tarry until we come to you, then we'll stand still in our place and we'll not go up to them. Now, he didn't say, if they say tarry, then we're going to cut and run. If they say come up, we're going to go up. Jonathan said, if they say tarry, which means wait there until we come to you, he said, well, wait and fight them here. Because he had a good strategic position. You remember, he had this, this, these two rocks. And, you know, you're going to fight one-on-one -on -one if people got to go through the rock to get to you. It's a place that you could hold. It's a good strategic position. And so he's making a decision between a bad strategic position with the help of God and a good strategic position with the help of God. But he's not making a... He's not differentiating between we're going to fly, flee or we're going to fight. He said, we're going to will you fight here or we'll fight up there. And if you were to look at the garrison of the Philistines, of course it would have been from a, a, per, an elevated perspective. And if you've ever played King of the Mountain, how many of y'all play King of the Mountain? Kids still play that where you kick people in the head when they try to go up the hill, <laughs> knock them down? The sort of thing. Snow, right? The, Florida doesn't have the snow piles. But how many of y'all grew up up north where there's snow? Okay, so when they pile the snow in the parking lots of Walmart and your mom goes in Walmart, they go, wait in the car, right? No, and then right. mom goes into Walmart, and everybody out of the car, let's play King of the Mountain! And you climb up on the top of the mountain, and it's probably, oh, I don't know, at least as tall as this ceiling, the piles of snow, some of them are higher. You get on the top, and you go, I'm the king of the castle, you're the dirty rascal. And somebody tries to come up and take you down. And when they get close, you just kick them. Boom, they go rolling back down. And, you know, you got to get, you to take somebody down from the king of the mountain, really everybody's got to attack at once. And while they're kicking somebody here, somebody else pulls their leg here, makes them do the splits on the top of the hill, and they pull them off and 
push them down, they split their face open, but it, there's plenty of ice there, so it's okay. And that's, that's the way you play growing up. That's the way kids play, right? So king of the mountain. Well, the garrison of the Philistines is up here, and Jonathan's like, let's crawl up. Some years ago on our honeymoon, Melissa and I were in Moab, Utah. We were driving, uh, not Moab, but not far from Moab, Utah. And we were driving, and you know how they have those sandy rocks where the wind blows nice-looking caves and holes in them. We thought we'd stop on the side of the road and walk about 10 miles over to where we saw some cool-looking caves. And we were climbing up this slope to get into the cave, and really the pitch was about like that. It didn't look so bad from the road, but it was a high pitch. And I'll tell you what, going up that thing is pretty dicey, pretty scary. And I remember climbing up, you know, trying to just get a toehold or handhold and sliding down and getting back up. Can you imagine trying to fight your way up? Mm. Fight your way up while you're, you know, you just, there's just nothing to get a hold of. So that's what Jonathan is contrasting. He's saying, if God wants us to fight easy, we'll stay here and they'll come to us. If God wants us to fight hard, we know that the victory's ours and we're going up. Mm. That's what he did. So this is where they, they exposed themselves to these individuals. They showed themselves. And verse 11, they both then discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. And the man of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And he said, Well, we want to see. <laughs> and Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered me them into the hand of Israel. Where did Jonathan allow for failure here? Well, you know, if they come down, we might lose. Or if we go up, we might lose. Jonathan said, all right, we'll, we'll beat them here between the rocks or we'll beat them up on the top. Friend, listen. One of the reasons you as a believer can be courage is because you have a cause that's real. You have a God that's able to do anything. And God's never lost anything. And so this isn't like, you know, believe in yourself and you'll succeed. This is believe in God. And you can't fail. And that's Jonathan's attitude. Oh, I, I think this about Jonathan, my impression of him. If the scenario had happened differently and the Philistines would have said, Terry there and we'll come to you, I think Jonathan would have said, Behold, the Lord hath given the victory into our hand. You know what I mean? It was just like, you know what? God's going to give us the victory. Now, how did he know that? See, if you were to read earlier carefully, when Saul is under the mango tree with 600 men, not mango tree, I know, just see if you pay attention. Okay. When Saul is under the pomegranate tree with 600 men, did you notice that the priest with the ephod was there? So you're supposed to ask God, you're supposed to inquire the priest and say, shall we go up, yes or no? And then he gives you a Urim and Thummim answer, yes or no. Right? God will give you the victory. God will give you the victory. Saul had the priest and the ephod. Jonathan just had a relationship with God and knew his character. He didn't need to ask. Christians spend so much time asking God things that they ought to just already know. God doesn't want the, doesn't want the children of Israel hiding in the rocks from the heathen. God, should we hide in the rocks from the heathen? <laughs> Stupid question. There's no good answer for it. Right? Right? So Jonathan is not sitting under the mango tree. He's going out and looking to see God do something. You'll never see God do something unless you just get to know Him and His character and just confidently step forward. Christian, you could apply this in so many ways. But this is what courage is. This is biblical courage. Knowing who God is, knowing what God wants, and just doing it without hesitation. Now, in uh, verse 13, Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet. All fours. Can, I, can you imagine this? He's probably got a shield of some sort, and he's got a sword. Him and Saul were the only ones, he and Saul were the only ones that had, had weapons. So he's climbing up, and I don't know what his armor bearer had, a good stick or something, I don't know. And Jonathan's climbing up and... How afraid would you be of a guy crawling up a hill to get you? <laughs> well, the Bible says, and, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearers slew after him. So Jonathan goes up, and he's like, whop! And the guy goes down, and the armor bearer goes, sunk! And he's dead. 
whop, and the Arab Bear's like, I'll finish him, boom. And they're just going, and people are falling, you know, and if you could imagine a group this size, you know, and you just kind of start over here with this big guy, and, you know, and you go after him, and then Jonathan looks at this guy, I'm coming for you, and the Arab Bear, shunk, and then... And Jonathan comes with this guy, and then this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and just one at a time. If you're back there, and Jonathan gets about halfway to you, Bleed. you're like, mm, this is not going very well for anybody <laughs> that stayed. And so all of a sudden, here's two guys crawling up a hill. And literally the heathen turned tail. The Bible says God did some things here. In verse 14, after that, that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men with, within, as it were, a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. So right away, I mean, they, they, two guys drop 20, 1 to 10 is the ratio there. One guy takes 10 guys. And there was a trembling in the host, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers. They also trembled. Then the Bible says, and the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. Here are people who are like, oh, oh, what are we going to do? And then the earth starts shaking, and it's like it gets real shaky at that time. You know? And so God has compounded things. And all of a sudden, see the realization here is, man, who are these guys? These are some bad dudes coming at us. We're in trouble. And then the earth shakes, and you realize, it ain't just these guys. It's not just these guys. Somebody way bigger than these guys. Somebody that can shake the earth. Can you win at that point? Mm -hmm. Two guys turned 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, multitudes like the sand on the seashore, and then the Israelites came out of the rocks and started chasing them. What did it take to get the Israelites out of the rocks? It took one man they said, let's go up to the garrison of the Philistines. It took another man that said, okay, do all that's in thine heart. Let's do it. And then it took them knowing who God is, acting on the knowledge that God can't lose, and responding instead. That's all it is. If you were to go to John chapter 14, and we just don't have time this evening, you look at Jesus going to the cross, explaining to His disciples that He's not going to be with them, but that in His Father's house are many mansions and that He's going to go there and prepare a place for them. And then He tells them that He's going to pray the Father and send another Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And that Comforter is going to abide with them forever. And the word another there is another like me. And so what Jesus is telling His disciples, His apostles in particular, but all believers, is that I'm going to not be with you bodily, and I'm not going to be able to do the things that I do for you. I'm not going to be able to lead you. I'm not going to be able to provide for you and protect you. But instead, I'm going to live in you, and I'll never leave you. In other words, Jesus could send you somewhere, and you're not with Jesus anymore. But when Jesus lives in you, you can't go anywhere and not be with and not have Christ in you. You're never alone. You're always, you always outnumber the opposition when God's in you. Do you hear me? You always outnumber the opposition when God's in you. And then in chapter 16, chapter 15, Jesus talks about, I'm the vine, my father's the husbandman. But in chapter 16, Jesus tells his disciples, It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Father, uh, the, the Comforter will not come unto you. The word expedient is a word that doesn't mean this is expedited or this is, this is the most efficient. The word expedient means better for you. Jesus said, better than you being able to travel with me is for my spirit to travel with you, in you. Why then are believers hiding in rocks? and in caves, and in holes. Why aren't we boldly proclaiming the gospel with the full power of God? And the answer to that is just pretty simple. First, sin. Sin. 
when you sin, the devil's able to tell you. He's the liar. He's the deceiver. He's able to tell you, God won't forgive you. God can't use you. And a lot of believers are hiding in holes because of sin. And they're afraid of being exposed by the devil. Friend, all you have to do is take care of your sin. Just got to take care of your sin. That will deal with your problem of courage. Why are believers hiding in holes? Well, because they don't see God. Because they don't see God. They don't understand that God is always a majority. And it's not close. 30,000 people aren't good competition for God. A million people is not good competition for God. You could put whatever number you want to on it, and men versus God, bad odds for men. Period. So we as believers ought to have courage. We ought to preach the gospel with courage. We ought to speak for righteousness with courage. We should be courageous. And that's our message for this evening. By the example of a man that really saw God that way. And we see what God did as a result. So Father, thank you for what we saw this evening from the example of this man Jonathan and his armor bearer. And the way that they literally turned the entire attitude of the children of Israel because of what they saw in you. Help us to have courage, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, you're dismissed.